Greetings to all of you from the Christian Medical College, Velour, and uh, welcome to this program. A special welcome to Dr. Mohan Rao. This session is part of a series of heritage lectures put together by Dr. Reena George and her team from the Department of Archives and Continuing Medical Education. Clinical services were started at Velour in 1900 by our founder, Dr. Ida Scudder and we have completed more than 100 years in medical education. CMC has been a pioneer in various fields of medicine, and one of them is renal transplantation. In 1971, exactly 50 years ago, the first successful live donor renal transplantation in India was carried out at Velour. It was a culmination of hard work and perseverance by a dedicated team of doctors, nurses, technicians from the Department of Urology and Nephrology and other sister departments. It marked the beginning of a new era of service rendered by the institution in patient care. Close to 4,000 renal transplants have been done till date. To tell you the story of how it all began, we are proud to have with us today Dr. Mohan Rao, the urologist and surgeon in the team who performed the first successful renal transplant in the country. Dr. Mohan Rao is an alumnus of the 1955 MBBS batch of CMC. Following his general surgery training, he joined the newly started urology MCH program, the first in the country. As a faculty in the department, he was deputed to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Adelaide, Australia for training in transplantation along with Dr. K.V. Johnny from the Department of Nephrology. On returning to Velour, they set up the transplant program and the first transplant was done in February 1971. In 1976, he moved to Australia as a senior consultant in transplant surgery and associate professor, a post he held till his retirement in 2001, 2011. He then worked as an adjunct professor of surgery in the National University of Malaysia. Dr. Mohan Rao is an innovative surgeon. In 1997, he performed the first laparoscopic live donor nephrectomy in Australia in a little over a year after it was done in the US for the very first time. Very soon, he helped us start laparoscopic donor nephrectomy at Bella. He has trained and assisted numerous surgeons and helped start transplant programs in several countries. In recognition of his contribution, he has been conferred several awards, both in India and in Australia. They include the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Indian Society of Organ Transplantation, the Order of Australia for Service to Medicine, particularly renal transplant, transplant surgery. Dr. Mohan Rao will speak to us shortly on behalf of the Christian Medical College. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mohan Rao to deliver this heritage lecture. Welcome, Dr. Mohan Rao. Good afternoon to all of you. Okay. Journey to our first kidney transplant in Bella. The first successful kidney transplant in India was performed in our hospital on 2nd of February 1971. Before that, there were three attempts using deceased donor kidneys. Two transplants were done in Mumbai in 1965 by Prof. P.K. Sen. Their first patient died on the 11th post-operative day due to coronary thrombosis. The second patient died on the third day with terminating lung infection. Prof. Sen was a cardiac surgeon. He performed the first heart transplant in India unsuccessfully. Four years later, there was another attempt, this time at Benares Hindu University. Dr. Urupa and his group have transplanted a, a deceased donor graft unsuccessfully. These two senior professors have concluded that transplants will not succeed. India. End stage kidney disease 
is fatal without maintenance, dialysis, or transplantation. Professor P. Koshmi was the chief of Medicine 3 unit. He went to U.S. to gain experience in nephrology. On his return, dialysis machine was gifted to CMC. The first dialysis in India was performed again in our hospital in May 1961. Professor Koshi invited Koch come and help him with the dialysis. But he sent his colleague, Dr. Nakamoto. The patient was Kopeshwar Prasad Sahi, who was a Maharaja of Atva in Bihar. He, she and Nakamoto performed the dialysis. V.A. Matam, my classmate and previous director, took active interest in that procedure. I was working with Dr. Butt in surgery one. I used to assist Dr. Butt in inserting shunts for the dialysis. That was the introduction of me dealing with renal failure patients. And I spent all my working lifetime with these patients. In the early days, they did not have any access for dialysis. They used to insert glass tubes into the peripheral vessels by cut down. And at the end of the uh, dialysis, they used to tie them. And that way, within a few weeks, all the sites are exhausted and the patient dies. That all changed with the introduction of A.V. Shunt. Scribner was a nephrologist and he went around asking people for the solution. A biomedical engineer by the name Hinton came up with the idea of using Teflon. Teflon just came into the market and people were using it for non-stick frying pans. He fashioned vessel tips connected them with initially with Teflon tube, but later with flexible elastic tube. And these shunts lasted many, many months or even years. That created a new problem. The hospital patients were not dying. The hospital couldn't afford to buy more and more dialysis machines. This is a heavy shunt which can be used immediately after insertion. I used to be called to look at patients with acute pulmonary edema who needed dialysis. While the technician placed the machine, I could insert this shunt on the bed without any assistance under local anesthesia. With the number of patients wanting to go on to the dialysis, the hospital appointed a committee of citizens to decide who can go on to the program. The committee used criteria like their marital status, number of dependents, income, net worth, emotional stability, their job, past performance, future potential in deciding who goes on to the list. This was picked up by Life magazine and they published it in their magazine on November 9, 1962. This was the beginning of origin of bioethics as a discipline. And Dr. Scribner was given the title of the original Bioethicist. Later in 1966, the AV fistula appeared. This was started by two nephrologists, Brazier and Simino. It is a chance discovery. Dr. Simino 
was working as a phlebotomist taking blood from patients when he was a medical student. And he noticed that some of the Korean War veterans had these dilated vessel veins as a result of war injury creating a AV fistula. They persuaded a surgeon in the Kenneth who joined artery and vein to produce AV fistula. And that worked. Looking back in 1930s, Mayo Clinic has used AV, put in AV fistula in children with post polio paralysis. They thought increased blood flow to the limb would is in the recovery from the paralysis. That experiment did not work, and they gave up what they call heavy fistula was forgotten. The first time I ever heard about kidney transplant was from Dr. Joseph Murray. Dr. Joseph Murray worked in our hospital as a plastic surgeon for four months. During that period, he gave a lecture at our and runs about a transplant he has performed on the identical twins in 1954. Richard, the, the recipient, um, married the nurse who looked after him. He had two children and died eight years later after uh, a coronary thrombosis. After I established the transform program in our hospital. I visited Dr. Murray in Boston and he was very pleased that we have got transplant program. Professor Jacob Chandy was a principal at that time and just shortly after I finished my MCH urology, I belonged to the first batch of Indian trained I went to his ward, the neurology ward, to see a consultation. And Dr. Chandy uh, told me to see him later that day. I was quite worried, what have I done? Is there something wrong? When I saw him, he asked me whether I would go to Australia to train as a transplant surgeon. That was the beginning of the project. He went to Australia on a promotional tour at the invitation of friends of Villa. And he visited Adelaide, where he met Professor Basil Hetzel. He was a professor of medicine at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Dr. T. S. Koshi from Medicine too spent a year with him in endocrinology at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Dr. Chandy met Mr. Peter Knight also. Peter Knight is a New Zealander, studied medicine and specialized as a surgeon in England. He went to Peter Brent Bickham Hospital where Dr. Murray was. He worked in his unit. And Mr. Knight performed the first successful kidney transplant in Australia in 1965. I went there as his first uh, transplant registrar. He was a excellent surgeon and he taught me how to do a transplant. Dr. K.V. Johnny, he's not our alumnus. He joined Professor Koshi in uh, Medicine 3 in 1966. He was deputed by CMC to train as an ephrologist in Queen Elizabeth Hospital, the same hospital where I went later. This is the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, not a big hospital, it's only 500 beds. The first successful transplant in Australia was performed in this hospital. When I joined Mr. Peter Knight, he was exploring the possibility of adding a butyl radical to the 
in the RAN, the main immunosuppressive agent, to make it less toxic and just as effective. And my job was to test it on dog transplants. I used to do transplant dogs on alternate days with the help of the animal house technician. My routine used to be starting with the dogs first thing in the morning, I get them out of their kennel, and they climb onto the weighing machine, then come and sit between my legs while I take blood from their jugular vein and shove in the tablets. And they all do this because they know that I'm going to take them out for a run in the hospital campus. At the end of one year with Mr. Knight, Mr. Knight decided to go to Canada. He joined McMaster University and we were left with no transplant surgeon. At the same time, we had a new professor of surgery, a vascular surgeon who has done a few transplants, but not really interested in transplant surgery. And I continued to work with the new professor. Whenever we had two kidneys, he would come in and do the do one while I do the other one. And post-operative care, he wasn't interested. It was left to me. The kidneys used to be more often, the kidneys were from the bigger hospital, the Royal Adelaide Hospital. As soon as the patient's brain function was gone, the patient is wheeled to the theater where the anesthetist disconnects the patient from the respirator and allows uh, the cardiac arrest to happen. Soon, they will remove the kidneys, perfuse the, uh, through the renal artery, cold Hartman solution at 4 degrees centigrade and put it in high slush and transported by ambulance with the side and blazing. And we used to have the recipients ready by the time TB arrives. And we used to do the transplant. We did not have any preservation, kidney preservation unit at that time. So I depended on hypothermia using the Hartman solution. I spent more than two years because the hospital, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, did not have a, a replacement. I was promoted as senior registrar and CMC agreed to let me stay there till they found a replacement for me. I returned back to Bello without taking any holidays and joined duty in November 1970. I went and saw Dr. Webb a pediatrician who was the director of the hospital, whether I could start the transplant program. And he was rather careful. And he told me straight that not to be in a hurry till I'm ready. If I fail in my first attempt, that would be the end of the, me as a transplant surgeon, as no patient was to me. So he was very cautious. At the same time, he told me not to uh, expect any designated facilities, but make do with what is available. I was given a corner room in the M ward, the private ward, which had a veranda. So I converted the veranda into the nursing station. And we did not have any tissue typing facilities in CMC. Well, Dr. Balakrishnan from the All India Institute had the lab, tissue typing laboratory, and she agreed to do the uh, tissue typing for us. We used to get the blood taken in the middle of the night, sent to Madras by taxi to catch the first flight. Uh, to go to the 
holiday institute. We managed that way till our hematology department set up the lab that was where several years later. The donor said to have a, an archivograph, renal angiogram, to demonstrate the vascular anatomy. If we prefer taking a kidney with single artery to reduce the technical problems. If both kidneys have single arteries, we take the left kidney because it has a long penal vein. When I asked Dr. Johnson, Chandras and Johnson, who are radiologists, he told me that he doesn't have time to come into the angioplasty. We did not have any cylindrical particles. So I had to do the arteriograms using a technique of, through a percutaneous puncture of the aorta through the translumbar root. To make the patient donor lie down on his face, don't put his feet. Take a long needle, like a LP needle, and aim at the opposite uh, shoulder and that wants the needle, it will strike the spine. Then you withdraw a little bit, tilt it 15 degrees and that wants it again and you get a sudden change in the resistance. You know that you are in my order. This is a procedure which is not allowed to be done nowadays. And we did the angiograms that way. We did not have any post operative room except for what was given to us in the private world. Getting to theaters, one for the donor, one for the recipient, is being an impossible task during the working hours. So I talked to the theater committee whether I could operate in the night. The theaters used to be in the ground floor where the cardiology department is. And there were two theaters, adjacent theaters, one for neuro and another for cardiac. And I used to start around 7 30, 8 o'clock, and use those two theaters. We did not have any renal trained nurses. So we had to do the nursing part of it, especially the fluid maintenance, fluid balance, etc. Dr. John Hill returned to Wella six months before me. So he selected two candidates for transplant and put them on hemodialysis. Later, when people, so patients can't avoid hemodialysis, we tried peritoneal dialysis. Tank of catheters, the peritoneal dialysis catheters were not available. So they used multiple puncture technique. It was the practice at that time to remove the native kidneys. We tried several methods of removing both the kidneys together. Ultimately settled down with posterior lumbotomy. But my first patient was a polycystic disease. So I had to remove each kidney separately. But later on, the practice has been given. I think it helped us in monitoring the kidney function because every drop of urine that comes out is from the transplant. There was no Doppler ultrasound or nuclear perfusion scan at that time. We used to do very a meal to rule out the ordinal ulcer. And anybody had ulcer or had GJ vectotomy, a very popular operation in those days. Now given up. On the day of the operation, that is in the first of February, I went to see the donor and the recipient in the afternoon. And I didn't see the donor's wife at the bedside. So I asked the, the recipient's brother, what happened to her? Why is she not here? 
So he told me that uh, Adisa Satipati, Ambu Patjali, she died of snake bite. I knew that it is some story. And I didn't want to go into that. I just kept quiet. And next morning after surgery, when I visited the donor, she was there. So I asked this recipient's brother, what happened? Why did you tell me that she died? He said, oh, somebody told her that if he's giving the kidney, I believe they have the same word for kidney and testes. So if he gives his testes away, he's going to be impotent. And so he didn't want her husband to have the operation. So they locked her up. That, anyway, that's just a separate story. And we finished the operation. We started on 7.30. I dissected the kidney and left it on medical while the anesthetist, Dr. Martin Isaac, anesthetized the recipient in the next theater. I went to move to the next theater, prepared the bed, dissected the vessels. And I dissected the internal iliac artery, chased the two divisions because the kidney that I have was a right kidney with two arteries. The left kidney has got three arteries. So we had no choice except to use the right one that to the short renal vein and two arteries. We joined the two arteries to the two divisions of the internal iliac artery and finished the operation by around midnight as shortly after. As soon as the anastomosis was over, we released the clamps to let the blood flow in and kidney became turgid and pink, uniformly pink, and immediately started pouring out urine. The donor had received manitol and intravenous laces during surgery along with plenty of fluids so that kidney was at the maximum performance. And the recipient too was given manitol and laces. So that uh, produced quite a bit of diuresis. So the, after the operation, I went to the room and stayed with him, monitoring his urine output and biochemistry. As our nurses were not trained, the renal nurses. The morning after the surgery, I had a phone call from All India Radio asking whether the transplant was performed in CMC, even though we did not uh, announce it before the surgery. So the news spreads very quickly. Uh, we prepared two patients for transplantation and having seen the first patient go through without any problems, we planned for the second transplant after we break up two weeks and slowly patients started coming. There were difficulties like getting blood for emergencies. Even though we get the relatives to donate blood for the surgery, occasionally there is an emergency where the patient is bleeding and blood bank says there's no blood. So on two occasions with a bleeding patient, I had to go to the blood bank, give my own blood, take it and go to the theater and fix up the problem. Money was the other problem. Many patients couldn't afford dialysis medicines and long stay in Vela. The problem is once you start dialysis, you cannot stop it because the patient is looking good is no longer sick, patient family feels guilty to stop the dialysis. So 
we always make sure that there is a potential donor available for, to proceed for transplantation. And often we wouldn't start dialysis till we have cited a donor. Some donors were worried about their life insurance status and after the donation. So I had written to the, all the members of the uh, LIC board that to treat these donors as normal without any change in their premiums, as long as they remain normal tensive without any albumin in the urine. Now, our craft survival was 63% at first year. And the, most of the patients died of infection, both bacterial and opportunistic, because of the high steroid uh, component. This was the immunosuppression that we have used as a type of redness loan, and we see that I do some steroids. And for rejection episodes, more steroids, local radiation, anticoagulation and antiplatelet agents. I don't think any of them worked, except for the increased dose of steroids. This is our first patient with the team, myself, Dr. John, the nephrologist, Martin Isaac, our anesthetist, Dr. Butt, chief of my unit at that stage, and this is our third patient. The first kidney was given by his father that lasted for about four years. Then he received a second kidney from his sister. These are some of the patients that we transferred. This is the fourth transplant, fifth, and this lady is later. This is Dr. Johnny, myself. Dr. Sastri joined us two years after we started transplant. And Dr. Meshak Rebokaran joined maybe a little later than Dr. Shastri. This is another lady whom we transplanted. And again, she had a second graft by the time I was in there. And she was our first transplant mother. You can see that we started in 71. Had five cases, 72, six, and by 73, I think people had confidence in us and also more aware. So he started jumping. And three years, we were the only center offering transplants. In 74, three more units joined us Chandigarh PGI, Jeslok Hospital in Mumbai and Holland Institute. In 1974, Singapore University organized the first Asian colloquium in nephrology, where they invited all the Asian countries. And by that time, we have done 59 transplants. And Philippines was 51. But apart from Australia and New Zealand, we were the leaders in this field, some of transplantations. What have we achieved in the last 50 years? As a clinical procedure, it's widely available and relatively affordable. We have well experienced teams, even laparoscopic nephrectomy available. All immunosuppressive drugs are available. Disease donor programs promising. While I was in the first two or three years, we had two potential donors from the neurology neurosurgery unit. And I talked to the parents, they would not accept the inevitability of death. So it was impossible to get a deceased donor at that time. But now, Times are changing and people are more willing. Commercial activity still continues. 
which is a pity. And if anybody does commercial activity in other countries, they lose their license and they are severely punished. But for some reason, our agencies are not that strict. There's the number of transplants done in India is next to what are done in America. Many teams do hundreds of transplants in there, but they never publish their results in reputable journals. Training programs and accreditation is another problem. And there is no leadership from academic surgical departments, except for few. You can see how the results have changed. Patient survival has gone from 61% to 97, and graph survival to 95%. This is all achieved after the introduction of cyclosporin in 1984. Biggest advance is the newer immunosuppressive agents. What we thought was impossible, crossing the blood group barrier, is now possible. And people are doing able to incompatible donors in transplants. Highly sensitized patients can be desensitized for the transplant. Marginal disease donors. Previously, we never used to take donors above the age of 50. Now we take any age group. And the idea of putting two kidneys into one person was not a doctor's idea. There was a patient waiting on the list for several years, and there was a compatible donor. And the surgeon rang her up and told her that we got a compatible blood group donor. But I wouldn't recommend because they have the age. So she was clever enough to ask, what is his renal function? He said, no, I'm creatinine. So she said, why don't you put both the kidneys into me? Maybe I will get the same level of creatinine. And that worked. So nowadays, we are taking kidneys from people who are dead and about 50 years old. We take biopsy of the kidney as soon as it is removed, assess the age related changes, and decide whether you should put two kidneys into one person or put one kidney each. Live donors nowadays, the people with mild hypertension uh, and single drug are acceptable. So there are some concessions that is happening there. And a patient, sometimes you'll find the donor and the recipient are incompatible blood groups. But they may be compatible with another pair. So you can swap the kidneys, which is the idea that started by the Koreans, and they can exchange the kidney between seven pairs but it all has to be done on the same day so that nobody can back out. It is happening in India now. On the surgical side, one of the early advances we had was CT angiogram. I went for a meeting in two years and there was a presentation by a radiologist of a single case of a single renal angiogram. And he said that it may have a potential in donor assessment. So after I returned, we did not have, our hospital had no CT machine, but there was one in Harvey. I talked to them whether they could do angiograms in their setup without charging the patient or charging the unit. And we did 15 uh, and programs and compared the results and when there was very good correlation. So we gave up the conventional angiogram which required functional of the So 
we were the first in Australia to introduce CT in a angiogram. Laparoscopic nephrectomy. One day I was searching on the internet and saw that Johns Hopkins Hospital has done a laparoscopic donor nephrectomy. I was fascinated and I thought we must have it. They did their first case, so they are not ready to teach anybody. So I asked Otto Sucher, now called Telco, you know, the surgical companies, whether they would provide money to buy pins and uh, whether they could give me instruments free. And I told them, you know, if we succeed in bringing it to the clinical scene, we will you will have more business selling your instruments. And they agreed. And uh, I enlisted the help of a colorectal surgeon who was had better skills, laparoscopic skills than me. So between us, we worked in the animal house doing laparoscopic methods. When we were confident, we had to bring it into the clinical scene. So we had a lady who was scheduled to give a kidney to the adult son. So I went and talked to her that we got a new operation which we want to try. I have not seen it being done, not have I done, but we had a lot of experience in the pigs. And I told her the benefits of laparoscopic surgery, that it is less painful, shorter stay in the hospital, and a smaller scar. And I told her that I will make sure that her kidney will be safe and her son will have the transplant. If we don't succeed, she will have the open of which she is put. If we succeed, we are going to switch from open nephrectomy to laparoscopic nephrectomy. I thought she would say, oh, let me think about it, I'll come back and see you in two days. But instead, she said, go ahead. So we did the operation, took about five or six hours, and successfully removed it through the laparoscopic method. And after that, no one would like to have an open method. So all the cases done after that were laparoscopic method. At that time, Dr. Lionel Jan Rajman, our hospital was working with me and he presented our experience of 10 cases at the transplant society meeting and he was torn to bits because all the surgeons said, you know, what is wrong with the operation that we have been doing for the last 30 years to replace it. But I had to tell them, you know, that patients will demand a better operation and it's this one will be the standard later on. And also told Lionel that, you know, I can't teach him because I myself was learning. But one day I'll come to Velo and teach him. So a year and a half later, when I had enough experience, I told Arthur Sucha, can I go and conduct a workshop in India, in Velo? Can I have instruments to do eight cases and preferably deliver to the hospital in Bella and also the air ticket. So the day before I left, a big box was left on my office desk with all the instruments. So I rang the surgical rep and said what happened. They had problem with sending the instruments. Their sister concerned sending the instrument to Vero. And I said, okay, I'll take it. And when I landed in Madras, I went to the customs uh, supervisor and told him 
that for this instrument. So he asked me how much I'm going to be paid. I said, no, I'm not being paid anything. I'm, I'm doing it free. He said, oh, how much are these instruments? I said, I have no idea because it was a gift from the surgical company. I haven't paid for it. So how much is CMC going to charge more for this operation? I said, no more than the whole operation. So he said, no, oh, in that case, just take it and go. So we didn't have to pay any duty. So the first laparoscopic live donor network in India was again performed in CMC on 9th of April, 1999. So now that has become the standard. Every surgeon's obligation is to train younger surgeons. I think it is part and parcel of our responsibility. In every procedure, there is something you could share or let a younger person do. For your intern, we just started. Switching back the room itself is a great experience. For the first year surgical training, opening up that domain is a great thing to start. So I think that they can share in one operation uh, several steps. And mistakes do occur. You've got to be vigilant and correct them. And you learn more by fixing others' mistakes. It needs patience, understanding, and experience. Occasionally, it might for surgeons who will not teach or train others, which is not a good idea. I have had trainees from Malaysia, China, Thailand, India, and also a few networks who learned how to do transplants because they have chosen a ship model, a big model for their PhD to do. So I taught them how to do transplants. And finally, I'm always open to new ideas and new techniques. Thank you for your patience.